So let's suppose I have this force F, and force F is applied at a location which is a at a position R relative to point P. And if I take the vector cross product R cross F, I get this thing I call the moment. And what is the moment again? Well, this vector cross product, what it does is it takes this vector F, the force F, and it pulls out a component that's perpendicular to R, right? It's this, right here, this green vector is the component of F that's perpendicular to R, and it's this part that contributes to the moment. It's this component of F that's causing a twisting action about point P. All right, what I'm going to do next is somewhat similar. Let's say I have this particle out here. This particle has a velocity right now. In fact, it has a mass at times a velocity, which is a linear momentum. And this particle, at least at the moment, is at a position that I call R relative to the point P. And what I'm going to do is define this quantity I call H. I'll give it a name in a moment. But it is the vector cross product between this position vector R and that linear momentum M times V. It's a cross product, so this thing produces another vector which obeys the right-hand rule. In this case, it's going to be a vector that's out of the screen, pointed right at you. Now, if we were to think about what this vector cross product means, what we would do is we would split this momentum up into two pieces, one which is parallel to R, and another one which is perpendicular to R. This component that's parallel to R would not contribute into this vector cross product, but the perpendicular component would. So this vector cross product is filtering off this perpendicular component of the momentum, and it's weighting it by how far it is from the point P. And what we have is a component of momentum that has a tendency to rotate around point P, and it's weighted by how far out from point P it is. So the farther you are out, the more of this H that you have. And perhaps right now I should give this H a name. It's called the angular momentum. Now, angular momentum is this really cool thing if you know where to look for it, if you know how to find it, and if you know how to interpret what's happening to it. So let me make some space to manipulate angular, angular momentum mathematically. So the first thing I'm going to do is take the time derivative of this angular momentum. So h dot. And let me ask you to pause here and think. What does this angular momentum look like? I'm going to take the time derivative of this right-hand side here. What's that going to look like? Pause it and write it down for yourself. Okay, so what we're doing is we're taking a time derivative, so we're looking at how things change in time. As this particle's moving, it has velocity, right? So the particle's moving, R is going to be changing in time, right? And also, if we've got a force acting on this body, velocity or its momentum could be changing in time. So both R and V are changing in time in general. We'll assume that the mass is constant. So what we have is a, is a product, and, we have, and when we take the derivative, we have to apply the product rule. So what I have is the derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second, right? Classic product rule. And next we have to make some observations of what's going on here. R dot, what is that? It's the rate of change of position. There's another name for that. It's called the velocity. So R dot is velocity. We're taking vector cross product with momentum. And then next piece we have is R cross M time derivative of velocity has a name also, it's called the acceleration. Now do you see the where I'm going next? I'll give you a second, you can pause if you like. Where we're going to next is, we, well, two things really. The first term is a velocity cross mass times velocity. Remember, this is a vector cross product, and we've got two vectors here. We've got a velocity and we've got mass times velocity. These two vectors are pointing in the same direction. In fact, they're the same vector, except for one's multiplied by, by the mass. So whenever we have two vectors that are parallel to each other, their cross product is going to be zero. So this term drops out completely. And then the next term, I have R cross MA, and hopefully this is ringing a bell to you by now at this point in the class. MA, that's the by Newton's second law, this is R cross F, right? F equals MA. And finally, what is this? R cross F. In fact, I hope you remember seeing it at the very beginning of this video. This is, by definition, the moment about point P. So what we have just proved mathematically, rigorously, is that the time derivative of angular momentum about point P, that is equal to the moment about point P. This thing is so important, I'm going to put a box around it. All right, there's one more thing I want to do in this theory video. Let me scroll down so I can work. I'm going to take this result that we just derived and rewrite it. I'm just going to put the moment on the left side and the time derivative of the angular momentum on the right side. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to integrate both sides with respect to time. And these are going to be definite integrals. I'm going from time 
time ta to another time that I'm calling tb. Now this latter integral is actually quite simple, right? I'm taking the time integral of a time derivative. And essentially by definition, this is just the angular momentum itself. But since we're doing a definite integral, and this, I have to put the boundary conditions on there, this is going to be the angular momentum at time b minus the angular momentum at time ta. Now if you think back, this might look pretty familiar. What we're doing here is something with angular momentum very similar to what we did with linear momentum, right? And this expression right here, right here on the right hand side, it's a change in angular momentum. Angular momentum at time tb minus angular momentum at time ta. And what we have on the left hand side, if you look at this piece right here, it looks very similar to our impulse we had before. But it's not a time integral of force, it's a time integral of moment. And what we call this is the angular impulse. And what we have essentially is an angular impulse, angular momentum principle. And just like with the linear impulse, linear momentum principle, I like to write this in a slightly different way. And when we write it this way, it says the angular momentum at time tb is equal to the angular momentum at time ta plus this thing I'm calling the angular impulse. Just like the linear impulse momentum principle, the new angular mo impulse momentum principle is a vector relationship, right? These angular momenta are vectors. This momentum is a vector. The time integral of the momentum, a vector. And what we have here, the final result, is the angular impulse momentum principle. And that does it.